All right, all right, all right. Welcome to Corporate Junkie. I am your man, Corp J. And thank you all for joining me on this live video. I am excited to really bring you all this topic. I've got a great, great, great show for you all today. We are going to be talking about the history of Afrobeat. I am going to be giving you guys a deeper perspective on, on the history of Afrobeat. Now, there's a lot of conversation around this. There's a lot of conversation about Afrobeats um, with the S and Afrobeat without the S. And so I'm going to be going over a lot of that history with you. Um, it, it's a conversation that has sparked a lot of uh, controversies. It's a conversation that has, uh, it's a very passionate conversation right now that we're all having uh, countries in uh, the uh, African continent are having this conversation. Now, there was also, I'm going to talk to you guys about a recent documentary that was also released uh, re uh, in regards to this particular uh, conversation. Uh, it was released by uh, a gentleman named Ayo uh, uh, Shanaya. Um, and it was, it's called Afrobeats, The Backstory. I'm going to talk to you about this particular documentary. And I'm going to tell you why this documentary, in my opinion, and based on what I saw in the documentary, really, really causes more confusion around the topic of Afrobeats and the history. I'm going to give you my perspective and I'm going to highlight certain part of what the documentary really kind of focused on, what it failed to really do, and why it caused more of a confusion and really murky the water uh, and didn't really um, do what I thought the documentary should have done. And then I'm going to give you my, my own perspective regarding the whole, uh, the whole story and the incident around Afrobeat uh, and Afrobeats with the S. Uh, why that really takes away from Nigeria's legacy and denies and steals from Nigerians and their legacy. I'm going to talk to you about that. So we've got a lot to cover. Okay, so let's let's go into it because I've got quite a few things that I want to go over with you guys. So on the documentary, first of all, I want to say that uh, kudos to the brother uh, Ayo uh, Shinaya. Kudos to him um, for really even attempting and taking a stab at the uh, the whole topic and um, and try and, and at least presenting some type of. Um, um, data or historical reference to what we know today as the music genre, Af Afrobeat and Afrobeats. Um, so uh, kudos to him. It is not easy to really put a, document a documentation or documentary like that together. Uh, from my understanding, it took years for him to put that together. So kudos to him for at least putting something out that uh, is, so some of us can kind of reference some of the events that we all know that took place, some of the artists that really kind of played certain role. Um, so kudos to him on that part. Now, however, I want to go ahead and uh, and talk to you guys about what that documentary really failed to do and what damage that documentary did. Understand that this documentary is an opinion of one man. It is not based on the history of Afrobeat, as I am going to uncover uh, on this video, it is an opinion of one man. It is one man's perspective, okay, based on his experience, based on his optical vision, and he told you that. I mean, this is words from Ayush uh, Shanayer. He actually says it, that this is his own his own experience, right? So understand that that is not a um, a, a history of Afrobeat. The documentary um, Afrobeat, the backstory, isn't a history of Afrobeat. At least it's not a detailed history of Afrobeat. Okay? So the documentary covers only a certain part of the timeline. In my opinion, based on the 12th episode, and there are 12 episodes, 
the last two episodes is what I find uh, problematic. Episode 11 and 12. Um, most especially episode 12. And I'll tell you why later on. Because that particular episode, in my opinion, is where I think that, uh, you know, the gentleman really, really caused more of a, uh, a chaos and a divide. And there is a one-liner he made in that um, in that documentary that I am going to tell you later on why that is problematic, as well as tell you why that documentary uh, further really deny Nigerians the credit and the legacy of Afrobeat um, and Afrobeats. Okay, so it goes through ten episodes. Most of which, uh, in, in when you really watch the episodes, really kind of really spends and delves into a lot of the new sound that, we're, that we have today. Not the old fella sound, not the old Afrobeat sound. He delves into, he delves into that a little bit, but not in, in detail. Most of what the documentary really, really covered uh, were like the, uh, the new age type of sound, you know, where today's Afrobeats, uh, is a mixture of pop culture, Western culture, and Western influence. So you find him really kind of walking through the timeline of, you know, the 90s, uh, the 99, and all the way to uh, present moment. So he highlights certain uh, key artists that really made a pivotal, pivotal impact on the music today, which I, I wasn't, I wouldn't really, you know, I wouldn't really, um, you know, argue on that part. Um, but again, though that particular timeline and what the document really focused on are what are the Afro beats with an S. Okay, I'm going to tell you why the Afro beats with an S is problematic and why I don't agree with it and I, why I think that it really denies Nigeria and, um, you know, dilutes the, the legacy of Fela who created Afro beats. So, so let's talk about, I'll get back to the documentary. Let's talk about the history of Afrobeat without the S. And I've mentioned this already in, um, in one of my past videos. So Afrobeat as is documented, which this, do, uh, document, this documentary filled and really didn't uncover in depth, uh, was founded back in the 60s and it wasn't until the 70s that the word, the name Afrobeat was actually given to the particular sound that Fela uh, created and was really kind of uh, dabbling into in the 60s, late 60s, all the way into the 70s. In my past videos, I mentioned how, you know, Fela studied in London, in the school, uh, London School of Music. And right after he came back home, he was heavily influenced uh, by quite a few genres that really existed prior, before, uh, you know, Afrobeat really existed. Genres like jazz, um, you know, um, juju music, music, um, Fuji, um, high life. You know, these were heavily influenced uh, and played a role um, in the formation, or at least playing a role with Afrobeats. Now, that is not unusual, okay? Because every music genre that exists. Has borrowed or been has been influenced by previous music genre, so that is not a new thing. So if you think about like the music genres that we know today, so let me take for example hip hop. Um, hip hop uh, was heavily influenced by reggae. Okay, as a matter of fact, the founder of hip hop, um, DJ Cool Herc, uh, was a Jamaican national who, who flew in or who immigrated from Jamaica to the United States. West Bronx, Bronx, and hip hop was founded. Same thing with rock and roll. Same thing with pop music. Same thing with uh, jazz. All of these music that existed in their own time really were affected or influenced by previous music genre that predates them. Okay, so that's very important to know that. So the same with high life. High life was heavily influenced by calypso. Calypso's music genre was is a creation of um, Trinidad, you know, the Caribbeans. So that existed way back in the uh, 18th century. So we're talking about during the slavery era, 
That's when Calypso sort of emerged in the 18th century. Um, then high life emerged in the 19th century or 20th century, I should say. High life emerged. So high life was around in 1920, 1930. Uh, that's when high life really kind of took root. Um, and then Afrobeat later on in uh, 1970. So understand the steps and the progression of this music. It plays a huge pivotal part in this. Now, why am I going through all of that? The reason why I'm going through all of that is because in the documentary, and this is the problem I have in the doc with the documentary. This is why I said the documentary really did not do what I thought the documentary, really, the documentary really should have done. I thought this documentary was a history of Afrobeat, hence his name, the backstory. But it was not the history of Afrobeat. As a matter of fact, it did not even touch the history of Afrobeat. It didn't go in depth into what I've just talked about in terms of timeline, in terms of all of that. It just really kind of stayed on the surface. Spent more of the, the episodes were more focused on the new age artist that we know. So talk about, the, you know, people like the tribesmen that were in the 90s, um, the plantation boys, um, the remedies, those groups that existed primarily in the, eight, in the late 80s, you know, all the way into the 90s, that's where this, and all the way into, you know, what we know today as the type of style and artists that we know today. So that's what the documentary really focused on. So it didn't go as far back into the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, all the way into the 1800s, didn't do all of that, okay? And that's important for you to understand that the inspiration for Afrobeat was heavily influenced by music genres that predates both high life, as well as um, Afrobeat with an S, okay? Now, what the problem I have with this documentary and why I think this is a problem is because while we are in this uh, heavy, intense, or highly, uh, what I would call um, highly contested or highly debated uh, era in terms of the question of Afrobeat, and he knew this. I think Ayo knew this with all due respect, which is why I think he waited till the last two episodes to really delve into the history of Afrobeat. Because I would imagine when he was putting this conversation together, putting this documentary together, if he had placed episode 11 and 12 right at the beginning of the episode of the season, I think people would have tuned on. I think he would have lost a lot of people because most people would have disagreed with his stance and disagreed with his uh, historical reference on the origin of Afrobeat. So I think as a strategy, he went all the way till episode 11 to begin talking about the history of Afrobeat, Afrobeat with the S and Afrobeat without the S. And then the episode 12 was where he literally, in my opinion, really failed in this documentary, in my opinion, respectfully. And I say this because he equates the origin of Afrobeat with high life. You would find him throughout these two episodes really kind of pinpointing that Afrobeat really emerged from high life. Okay? You would find him, and he, at one point in, on the episode 12, he literally made a statement that Afrobeat comes from high life. Now that is a very... Uh, um, false statement, okay? So I'm going to challenge the premise of that. And here's why I'm going to challenge that. Because it's to, 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 to make that type of assumption or to make that kind of statement, I will say, is to give credit to high-life Ghanaian music as though Ghanaian music was the only music that Fela, right, was inspired by. Okay, this is this is he. This is his uh, his his uh, his he's making sense of what Afrobeat and where Afrobeat really came from. So to give to say that Afrobeat with, without the S, which obviously Afrobeats with the S was really spawned from Afrobeat. To make this statement that that was heavily was with the foundation of it was high life is a wrong statement and is not true because that gives the whole entire credit to 
to high life, which is why a lot of Ghanaians claim hold to Afrobeat origin. And that is not true. Because understand that during Fela's time, okay, high life was now becoming popular. But Fela was also heavily influenced by funk, was heavily influenced by juju music, was heavily influenced by Fuji, was heavily influenced by jazz. All of these genres make up what Fela now formed into his own music, what he now put together, the formula of what we now know today as Afrobeat. Halai played a portion of it, just like what we have today. It is not unusual for a new music genre, as I mentioned earlier on, it is not unusual for a music genre, which is starting, or music genre that is a new one, to be heavily influenced and inspired by previous music genre. Every music genre did this. Hip-hop did that. With, with reggae. Hip-hop also did it with rock and roll. Hip-hop did it with a lot of even jazz. You find that with hip-hop. Now, would you now say that hip-hop, uh, the reggae founded hip-hop, or hip-hop was formed out of reggae? That would be a wrong assessment to say. Okay? So what he did, which I think it was very irresponsible to put that type of information out there, was he literally gave the impression or put out in the way, in, into, the, uh, into the production that Ghana alone and High Life alone formed Afrobeat. And that is not true. That is factually incorrect. Okay? That is factually incorrect. Now, the part that I would concede to was the naming of Afrobeat. Okay? It is true that the name Afrobeat was given to was given to Fela by a Ghanaian. It is true. As a matter of fact, we know this because, you know, Tony Allen said so. And Tony, Tony Allen was um, the uh, drummer for Fela's band. He was one of his partners. So he traveled around with Fela. As a matter of fact, which he uncovered in the documentary, and I've even seen all the articles on this, Tony Allen said that a promoter that they were working with when Fela had formed his music, which he formed in Nigeria, okay? When Fela had formed the music, he didn't know what to call it. But he knew that the music flavor and the style was a lot different from what was already existing. It was different from high life. It was really different from funk. It was different from uh, Fuji. It was different from Juju music. You go, even though all of these genres really influenced his music style, but that's his style was a lot different from every of this music genre. So it was actually a Ghanaian who suggested the name Afrobeat. Now, does that mean ownership? No. Simply suggesting a name does not give you ownership. If I give birth to my child and you suggested a name that I call my child, does that make it your child? Does that make my child your child? Let me give you another one. If I formed a business, I came up with all the strategy of a business. I come up with the marketing strategy. I come up with the uh, uh, logistics. I come up with the, the, the blueprint for the business. And you simply just gave me a name for the business. Does that make it your business? No. It doesn't. Okay? There's, you will never find any legal precedence of ownership on that. Okay? It doesn't give you an ownership. So, so that is a fact. The fact that Afrobeat, which is factual because it comes from, the, you know, Tony Allen would know. Okay? So he says that Ghana, a Ghanaian, gave the name suggestion to Fela and Fela accepted it as Afrobeat. But that does not mean by any way, means of, uh, any means whatsoever, that Ghana formed Afrobeat. It also does not mean that Afrobeat was heavily, only heavily influenced by High Life. High Life played a role as well as every other music genre as I mentioned early on. So that is, that is the part that he failed to really, really um, drive home. And I'm going to tell you that his final statement in saying that 
high life, Afrobeat is a foundation of high life, is also false. That's why I say it's false. Because it, it's, it's literally taken away from the legacy of Nigeria and the legacy of Fela. Okay, because high life was heavily influenced by Calypso. So should now should the Caribbeans now go on and say that they founded High Life because High Life was heavily influenced by Calypso? Should they even say that they own High Life? See if you see see how you can go down that road if you start to really kind of murky the waters. It makes a difference where a music is formed. It makes a difference where a music is founded. Okay, so there are two things that tie a music back to a culture. Two things. The location from where the music was founded and the people or the group that found the music. Those two things make a difference. Those, that's how you tie a music or a particular style of music back to its origin. Those two things. It matters where it was founded, where that person was at or the group of people were when it was founded, okay? And it also matters who found it. Those are the two things you can tie music back to. It's the same thing with hip-hop. If DJ Cool Irk had founded hip-hop in Jamaica prior to coming to the United States, it would not be owned by the United States. It won't. It would be Jamaican, okay? Same thing as we know reggae. So it's, it's important where a music is founded. Same thing with ro uh, rock and roll. If these music were founded outside of the United States, it would not be owned or claimed by the United States. It would be claimed by wherever it was founded. So that's important to know that. So when Fela founded Afrobeat, or the sound and the flavor of Afrobeat was founded in Nigeria and was founded by a Nigerian. Okay, so that's, that's clear. Understand that. So now that brings me to Afrobeats, okay? So let's talk about Afrobeats with the S. And let me tell you why that is a, a that's why, why Afrobeats with the S really takes away from Nigeria's legacy. Let me tell you why it robs Nigeria of its legacy. And why that documentary further helps it to rob Nigeria of its legacy. See, when we're talking about culture, when we're talking about music, it is important for you to understand that when you have something like a culture and you have music, music ties its a legacy. Okay? It's, it's important to understand that. It's a legacy, which is why many countries protect the ownership of these legacies. It is not as easy, as simple as just, okay, it sounds great and we make money from it and we're all good. No. You have to understand that it goes deeper. It represents a people. It represents a culture. It represents a history. It represents a lot of events. All that is tied to music. It is not just a bunch of melodies and strings and beats that put together. There's a story behind that. And if you don't understand that, you're going to dilute it by adding what I call an S to something that's already a legacy. You understand what I'm saying? Okay? Because Afrobeat is a Nigerian legacy founded by Fela Kuti. Now, I understand that the sound today that, is, that we're hearing today is far different from what we know as the sound that Fela did, which included a lot of Fuji, a lot of jazz, a lot of what I've just talked about. I get it. But does that mean that we changed the name? Does that mean that we now dilute it by putting an S? Because that's exactly what that is. Having put in an S to Fela's song dilutes and takes away from that legacy. That's one danger. The other danger is the Afro beats that was created by these guys from England, DJ Abrantine, right? The guys from Capital Extra that formed this new sound because they tried to whitewash it, which I would get to that later on. 
What that does is it merges everybody and piles every country in Africa into one pool. So the question now becomes, who owns Afrobeats? All right, everyone. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed this short video and want to see the entire video, make sure to click on this link right here and it will take you to it. Until next time, do not forget to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. And I'll see you all soon. Bye-bye.